Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Sheila Lamb and I'm with the Virginia SBDC Network. For those of you that are not familiar with our organization, the Virginia Small Business Development Center is a partnership program between the U.S. Small Business Administration, George Mason University, and local host institutions throughout Virginia. With 27 locations across the Commonwealth, we provide training and technical assistance to small businesses in their local communities. Our one-on-one -on -one advising services are available at no charge. Today's webinar, Responding to finan Financial Realities in the Craft Beverage sector, sector, is presented by the Virginia SBDC Network. We are recording today's presentation and it will be posted on our website, virginiasbdc.org. Due to the large number of participants, everyone's microphone is muted, but if you have questions during the presentation, you can type those into the Q&A box. We have also enabled the live transcript function, which you can show or hide via your own meeting, meeting controls. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the Virginia SBDC Craft Beverage Assistance Program Manager, Chris Van Orden. Thank you so much, Sheila. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for this conversation about how craft beverage producers can respond to a changing financial landscape. As Sheila mentioned, uh, my name is Chris Van Orden, and I'm the manager of the Craft Beverage Assistance Program at the Virginia Small Business Development Center at George Mason University. The CBA program is designed to provide industry-specific uh, technical assistance to Virginia's craft beverage sector. So today's program will be a free-flowing conversation covering a range of financial issues. Uh, we're we're going to leave a good amount of time for questions and answers. Um, please feel free to chime in as we go along. Um, and I can try to answer them as, uh, we'll try to answer them as best as we can, either during or immediately after our presentation. So uh, today I'm thrilled to welcome back Jason Sleeman, uh, Vice President of Craft Beverage Lending at United Community Bank. Um, he is he was the first speaker in this series, so I'm very excited to have him back uh, again to share an update on this. With his deep understanding of both finance and the craft beverage industry, Jason has helped breweries, wineries, and distilleries access capital. Welcome, Jason, and thanks for sharing your expertise. Chris, thanks for having me back. I, uh, what an honor to be first. I didn't know I was first. So to be back. <laughs> I didn't and, tell you that, did I? <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> well, this is, you know, I feel like we could, you know, deep dive, you know, every month if we were, if you had the time, but uh, I, I really appreciate you uh, offering your time again with us here. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad I'm getting an opportunity to do it. Yeah, well, it hasn't been all that long, you know, a year and change since we uh, last spoke, but there have been plenty of changes when it comes to the sort of capital space. So can you run down some of the biggest developments in the world of small business finance over the past year, let's say? Yeah, so, you know, you, you talk about a year and and, and uh, sometimes a lot changes in a year and sometimes not much changes in a year. I think this time... Uh, this year, there have been some relatively substantial changes uh, since we last talked, right? Um, one of the ones I think that we probably uh, are on everybody's mind uh, to kind of start with is uh, interest rates, right? So interest rates are a relatively hot topic for uh, most borrowers. Um, I get calls from time to time of someone saying, hey, I'm on this variable SBA rate, and now uh, it's much higher than I thought it was. And uh, you know, I get to speak on the interest rates from time to time, and I, I tell, <clears throat> tell people that we don't always have a long memory when it comes to uh, where interest rates are or were. Um, you know, March of 2020 was the lowest prime has been in the history of prime. Uh, and so we're coming off a historic low uh, as opposed to a historic high, you know, in uh, 81 when it was 21.5% prime rate was. And so uh, people can you know, think about the, the low, but they don't think about the high. And so, um, you know, the Fed has done a lot of work over the last, uh, I don't know, it, it has been probably about 12 months or so as they've been trying to work through this. And we've seen some, you know, pretty aggressive uh, quantitative easing, uh, you know, I, you know, it, it's really tightening at this point. Uh, you know, they went and made it very easy to borrow money and now they're making it a little bit harder to um, make that money. And so, um, there's a lot of people who are much smarter than I, but they're starting to predict. Um, I think they've predicted that at this um, uh, meeting that will be coming up in the next couple of days when they'll announce a new rate, that it'll be substantially lower than what the rates have been before. So what I would say is we did see a aggressive uptick to try and really slow things down. And I think uh, borrowers in the SBA space probably felt that. 
Uh, but I think what we're probably seeing going forward is more of a balance. I mean, we, we will probably see still rates go up some, uh, but it'll be at a lot slower pace than, than what we've seen. So, um, you know, I think as uh, people are looking at those options, they're thinking, geez, what do I do? Um, and one of the things that I always tell them, we may talk about this deeper later, is, you know, it's really kind of understanding that cost of capital and having the purpose of it. So borrowing at a higher rate is still fine as long as you understand how you're going to repay it. And, um, you know, there's a purpose for it. So, but, you know, that would be one <clears throat> one thing that I, I don't know that we really talked much about, but it has continued to be a very high problem is, although inflation has uh, waned a little bit, uh, you know, the one thing that if anybody has looked at doing an expansion or a startup or, you know, anything over the last 12 months, they really saw, you know, first and foremost, equipment costs. Uh, had gone up. And it wasn't so much that the individual piece of equipment was so expensive, but now we bring so much in the brewing industry from overseas that you had containers that were, you know, five, seven, 10 times what they would have normally been in normal condition coming over. And so someone would say, oh, I just need this small part. And, you know, it, that, that wasn't that bad. But if you needed three or four or five containers, you know, it made a huge difference in what was going on. So, so that's been you know, a big, a big part of it that that has started to wane down some. So I think we've gotten it a little bit more normalized there. But one thing that really hasn't normalized yet, and I don't know when it will normalize, honestly, like I wish I had a better crystal ball about this is on the construction side of things. Um, you know, construction has gotten very expensive, and the timelines have gotten very long. And so those things we, we are we as a lender have kind of changed how we handle that normally, we would have just kind of gone on good faith till we got towards the end. Um, but we had so many projects that got ended up getting blown up because we would get to the end of the project and they thought they were going to build something for 600 or 700 or 800,000. And it became 1.4, 1.5, 1.8. And they said, well, I just don't have the capability to do this. So we've, we've started asking our borrowers to do something a little different, um, a little more legwork up front, but to get a much better <clears throat> grasp on the construction aspect of it. And that's really helped uh, the process go much smoothly because people kind of are wa eyes wide open uh, when they come to that. And sometimes they say, oh, man, we need to adjust this project or do something differently because uh, the cost of this is, is substantially more than what we thought. So I would say those are the major factors that, you know, financially have uh, been in the news and we've been dealing with since we last talked. Yeah, when there's several variables at play, it's hard to say, well, you could try to index it and say, well, where is this? Have we improved? Have conditions deteriorated? And the answer is probably yes in both respects, right? You know, yeah, it's gotten harder on construction. And yes, interest rates are a little bit higher, not anywhere near historic highs. But we're starting to see supply chain issues resolve themselves. And inflation is, you know, theoretically getting under control. And it's, you know, no one's ever said that this was an easy industry. And there's always lots of things to take into account. But um you know, I think it's obviously just working with somebody like you to actually understand the landscape. That's why we're having this discussion today so that you're going into it with eyes open. You know, there's still lots of ways forward. So um, that's on the sort of kind of finance side. You know, are there, uh, you know, because you're focused, you know, you you are kind of run the craft beverage shop for, for your bank. So you obviously have a... Uh, a particular uh, eye out for what's happening within the industry. Are there any other, are there any trends that you're tracking in there that um, are kind of relevant to people looking to borrow whether for new or um, expansion or whatever the case may be? Yeah. So I think one of the first things is people understanding that there is a lot of options to drink and they, you know, <clears throat> the laws continue to evolve. And there are still some state. There are some states with super aggressive laws, and some states with still antiquated laws. And even the more antiquated laws, you're starting to see, you know, breweries or distilleries or wineries, depending on where they start, start to take on other permits. So what you're starting to see is you're starting to see the birth of these of these uh, beverage companies, right? So someone may have uh, a brewer's permit. And they go out and get a DSP. And so now they've got a line of canned cocktails or they've got, you know, 750 ml cocktails or they've added um, vodka or gin or a bourbon to, to what they're doing. Or, you know, the, the inverse of that is you've got a winery who says, well, we're already working with grapes. We might as well start making ciders. And so 
Now they're adding a cider and they're adding something else. So you're starting to see a blend of the brands um, because of the craft movement where people want to drink what has been made there. Um, it allows for these brands to take on a bigger group that just says, hey, look, I only serve beer. Uh, it allows you know, someone to make a quality product and reach a lot more people. So we're starting to see a lot of um, beverage companies come out of growth you know, from that and having more than just kind of one product. Um, we're starting to see, um, we, we, I don't think you can get around this, right. But, you know, I, cause I Googled this right before we looked, but brewery closures, 2022, I, I Googled that just to see, and there's 465,000 results. Now we all know how Google works and there's probably a ton of results that are not great. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, but it, it's something that is on people's mind, uh, that by the indication that there's a lot of searches. I don't, I still think, you know, in my mind, I thought we were going to see closures uh, happen right after COVID came in, right? I I think, you know, most of us that are deep, deep deep in the industry thought that it would just absolutely crater and it didn't. And it was, you know, to the credit of the SBA and the government and and some of those kind of things, they they really enacted quickly to help save our industry and uh, keep, keep that going. And so we are starting to see that money run out. And so now you're starting to see um, acquisitions. So you're starting to see people who say, I've done this for a while. We're not in terrible shape, but we're never going to grow like I thought. Because I, I do think that 10 years ago, everyone thought they were going to be the next huge thing. And they're finding out that 9,000 other people thought the exact same thing. And so not everyone can be huge. So we, we are finding that people are either changing their model and saying, you know, hey, we were, we were X. And now we want to be wise so someone can take over our large production facility and we're going to rebrand ourselves as a small tap room. We're going to do something different. Or someone's going to say, we were, we're in, you know, Virginia and now we want to be, you know, in North Carolina or we want to be in Tennessee or we want to be in Georgia or we want to be somewhere. And so how do we find a strategic acquisition? So I do think that we'll start seeing, you know, and we're already starting to see because I, I get people call me from time to time that says, hey, I saw this bruise in the news. Do you know someone there? And sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But the fact that those calls are coming to me tell me that there are breweries out there that are in acquisition mode and they are trying to buy. Um, And so I think we'll start seeing that. Um, We're also seeing uh, probably five or six years ago, we used to see a lot of people who had a dream, right? It it was, you know, they were a home brewer and they thought Jesus would be fun. Um, COVID has slowed that down. And I think the cost has slowed it down even more. The people realize this really isn't a hobby business um, that, you know, making a, you know, five gallon batch in your garage and making a 50 barrel batch and a large production facility uh, just don't feel the same. And so, so sl- we have seen some uh, slower openings, but in my opinion, the openings that are coming are a lot more, you know, on solid footing, wide eyed, know mm. what they're getting into, know that this is not, you know, something they're going to make a million bucks on. And they're going to be doing a lot more cleaning than they are, uh, you know, uh, celebrating and, and uh, you know, doing, doing things like that. Right. So we're, we're seeing that, um, you know, the, the other thing that I think we'll, we see a lot of is the expansion of the hub and spoke model. A lot of people are trying to do that where they would put a, you know, they've got a large production facility, you know, that may have just been how they had to open their state or do something like that. And now they're trying to figure out, man, distribution is very hard getting on the shelves. Why don't I put another tap room and I'll feed that tap room and feed another tap room and feed a couple other tap rooms where I can gain some high margin, you know, sales uh, to myself and and make something work from there. Yeah, yeah. Just seeing a lot of that innovation kind of, in, you know, it's no longer just the model of I am this kind of company. I will raise money to build off of a you know, build a new facility or take over this warehouse and build it in and I will make this and I will sell it in in my state or within these three states. It's kind of blowing up with some of the categories, people thinking a little more creatively. And, you know, th- some of that is, you know, being more ambitious or being more uh, creative on the process. Some of it is, res- you know, being kind of wise to what it takes to be successful these days. And I have to say, some of it is has to be the kind of regulations catching up, right? Just the ability to do more things. And, um, you know, we've had a, a webinar with a, somebody who uh, does consulting on the regulatory side and talking about the, how in the state of Virginia, where we're based, you know, like the the ability to 
be multi-product and hey, they've they've there's more and more people doing this. So if you're interested in launching a new company or expanding, like be aware there are new models that have been tested out now. You won't necessarily be the first, which is probably a good thing, unless that's really where you want to live, right on the margins. But there are there are people who have been successful trying out some new models recently, which is cool to see. Yeah, and, and it's it's nice to see, you know, you're starting to see some of the states allow for a lot more self-distribution. And I don't think that will be a, you know, there, I don't know many breweries who want to have a fleet of delivery trucks and have to be everyone, every everybody. But there are a lot of people who want one box truck or a pickup truck where they can throw kegs and, and do something like that. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. get, get something to a festival, get something to an account down the street. And that will, that is allowing for, uh, more growth and uh, more, you know, aggressive opportunity for people to try and say, okay, you know, let's hire some more people. Let's continue to grow the industry that way. Yeah. Yeah. The, the Virginia Graft Brewers Guild for everyone who's uh, attending today, who's in the brewery space is probably aware of the guild's efforts to start sort of the Virginia beer distribution company, similar to what the wineries currently enjoy. Um, you know, limited self-distribution that would be under 500 barrels and under um, in Virginia. So keep, if you're not aware of that, you can look it up. They've uh, they've been making some uh, some headway, been putting a lot of work on that front, and obviously distilleries were a control state, so uh, very different game. Any distilleries in here are playing um, on the sort of options available to you, but that's that's uh, you know this industry. There's lots of regulation, and that's how it goes. But um, so taking into account sort of the the trends you're seeing in the industry, as well as the sort of macroeconomic, uh, you know changes that have happened since we last spoke. What would you say all this means for breweries, wineries, cideries, distilleries that are looking now to secure funds, whether again, new or expanding? Yeah, so I, I think the very first thing that we're seeing when people are going is um, they're looking a lot more at what is the absolute necessities. So, you know, I've had some projects where, hey, we're gonna build a tap room and we're gonna put a fireplace and we're gonna do all these ornamental things and when we start when the rubber hits the road, you know, we've had some of these projects where they've, you know, they're they're going, oh man, if we do all this, it's going to cost us another four or five hundred thousand dollars. And so, we're seeing a lot of people scale down to say, what in this plan generates revenue? What are the absolutes that I have to have? And so, you know, where when money is cheap, people say, well, we can do all these additional things. It only adds a little bit more um, when you know rates are again not in my opinion, are not super expensive, but they're not free. Um, you know, you have to be a little bit more conscious of what you're doing. So now one of the things that one of the trends that we're starting to see is we're starting to see um, the tap room and the production facility start breaking apart. And so that that wasn't a trend that we had had been seeing uh, very much. What you were seeing was, hey, I want to be in this spot and I'm OK with my production and my tap room paying the same square foot cam, all those kind of things. And now we want to say, well, now this project's getting a little more expensive. Let me go put my production way over in this industrial area where I can get $5 or $4 a square foot. And then we'll put our tap room in where it's, you know, 20 or $30 a square foot. We're going to be in a much smaller footprint there. So that that's a trend that I think we're starting to see that, you know, it's not just one state. We're seeing that really across a lot of places that people are trying to figure out how do they be strategic. So not not lose anything in the customer experience. The customer doesn't know any, you know, doesn't lose that experience. They're still seeing some brewing outside. They're seeing some things like that. But, you know, if you're going to actually push out some decent beer uh, volume, then you're doing that, that offsite. So that, that's one thing we're seeing. Um, we're, we're also seeing people, you know, just trying to be very conscious of, you know, what, what, you know, what is this going to cost me? What is my return on investment? And some people are going and saying, you know, this, I'm not going to borrow today because it may have made sense six months ago or a year ago, mm-hmm. uh, but now we need to just go do more with what we have. So I think you're, you're uh, still seeing some people that say, well, we haven't fully maxed out our capacity. We haven't fully, you know, realized everything we could get out of this and probably, you know, had rates been three or 4%, they probably would have just said, well, let's do it. But now that they're, you know, 9%, nine percent, nine and a half percent, then they're, uh, you know, doing less. So I think that is something that, you know, people are, are really kind of taking, uh, you know, the, uh, they're taking a the stock of what's going on. And 
you know, it's also people asking a lot of questions about other products. You know, they're asking about 504. They're asking mm -hmm. about, they're saying, all right, is the 7A the right product for us? What, um, you know, you, you are seeing some that are working with uh, like CDFI type uh, mm -hmm. things or, or trying to find if there's a, um, a grant or a, a, a downtown revitalization fund. So people are, you know, looking at options that they may not have normally looked past and just said, well, this is the easiest path. Uh, and now they're looking at, okay, this may be where I get 85% of my funding, but can we do something about the 15% of ancillary things? Because, you know, a lot of those are not very big, right? So you, you're not going to get a million dollars in some of these type of things, but you maybe get a hundred thousand or 50,000 or, you know, 250. And, and so, you know, you're looking at it. And, and so people are layering some debt um, as opposed to just taking a single loan. Down. Yeah. That's interesting to hear that. Um just the 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 low rates made it just people said hey just add another hundred thousand on top just to round us out right just spending money right which in a, in a way that's a little crazy to think about and you know when you when you step back and look at it like oh just add another hundred thousand but but when rates are that low you could theoretically justify that but now people are does it do you feel like people are becoming savvier uh, consumers of financial products you know just understanding the difference between 7A, you know, a working capital loan versus a facility like a 504 loan? Is it, are people coming in with slightly more advanced questions now? It, yes, but I find half the time they're wrong, uh, you know, <laughs> and so they, they'll they say, well, I know this does this and I'll, and, and so I have to kind of unpack it. And sometimes they're very adamant about it. I'm like, all right, let me go find where it's actually printed and I'll send you where it's actually printed. So the good part about it is people are having the conversations, but people will say, well, I want to do this. And here's how I think. And, um, you know, and, and I mean, I think the thing that we have to look at is saying, okay, does this actually fit within the rules? Because some people will ask questions. I'm like, well, I haven't ever had it phrased that way. So there, there are a lot of people thinking about things from different lenses. And that's always helps both on the financing side and from the borrowing side to say, is this, you know, is this the right tool? Is this the right amount? What am I doing? How, how, how should I work through this to get the proper solution? Yeah, that's great. I mean, if people are coming in with a little more legwork because they know they just have to be a, a little bit sharper, you know, uh, and again, looking to additional resources is if I can if I can put in the time to go and compete for that grant or, you know, go after, like spend a lot of time building the community with my local, you know, economic developers to try and see if there's some way to get even a small amount to offset some costs to, you know, help, help our bottom line that probably makes them sharper borrowers. It means that they can borrow slightly less, but have a much better long-term trajectory by just, you know, being, being smart about cobbling together all of the different finances needed. For so, sure. yeah, well, that's very interesting to hear, but I guess it's heartening. Um, you know, smarter, smarter borrowers is always a great thing. Um, so for, Companies are planning, you know, pre-launch businesses here. Um, as you said, people come in sometimes really, uh, you know, knowing the products or believing they know their products and or rules of thumbs. You know, there's lots of information that you can find um, about, you know, what what how people should be approaching this. Are there any rules of thumb or commonly held beliefs about financing that folks should be thinking critically about these days? Maybe some former truisms that are starting to change a little bit? So one of the ones that I would tell you, and this is a, I guess this is a unique opportunity and, and um, uh, hopefully a way people are starting to think about it, right? So you have to kind of follow along here, but if you're a new startup and, you know, you can identify an existing location. So there are going to be breweries, cideries, wineries, distilleries that will be vacating spaces, going into new spaces, doing things like that. If you look at today's market and you can find, say, so say someone, say, say a brewery exits a spot. As the in-planning uh, person, what you have to do is you have to find out if it's one of three things, right? It, did they leave because the spot was bad, the leadership was bad, or their product was bad, or the fourth that I would tell you that sometimes happened is they just outgrew it, right? They, they became so big and bad that they the, the space was too low, right? But just identifying from those three, if you're saying, okay, there's potentially a problem, right? Especially if you see it as a failure, 
that it's either the spot was bad, the product was bad, or the people were bad, right? And so what you have to do is you have to identify it. And as long as you can identify that it wasn't the spot was bad, then you can go into that spot and say it was, let's say it was built out, right? Let's say it was built out in 2017. There's value in taking over that built spot that's already built than having to go out and do your own. So if you look at it and said the, the renovations to this building in today's world were 750 or 800, you know, there is substantial savings to be able to walk into that as a turnkey opportunity. So that's something that I would say that, you know, it, I guess when you go back to truisms, it's location, location, location. Mm-hmm. And this one, I'm going to say it's, is it already built? Is it already built? Is it already built? Right. Because <laughs> if it's already built, you know, then it saves, it can save you a ton of time and a ton of money because we, I, I saw that a solar project was supposed to go about 14 weeks uh, and it took a multiple months to get this, you know, taken out. So it wasn't 14 weeks, which was, you know, be about two and a, two and a half, you know, months. It was about five months for them to get it done. So, you know, much longer time frame, much longer. Um, so being able to get in and get running pretty quickly, I think would be something that if I was, if I guess I was looking at it and say, what would I want to know? Because I know what I know, what would I want someone to tell me, right? And so the number one thing is, you know, see if you can find something, you know, already. Especially I, I saw up in Connecticut that there was someone who said, if you will come take over our rent and our equipment payments, you can take over the brewery, right? And so that's a that's a pretty interesting, you know, opportunity to go in and say, well, we're just picking up rent, we're taking on the, I think it was like one hundred and forty or one hundred fifty thousand dollars left on the equipment. That that's a pretty low barrier of entry. Um, where if you're having to go out and source everything and and, and do all these um, you know construction and everything else, it, it pushes that barrier of entry pretty high. So that's you know the biggest thing I would say. You know, I, I still think that the number one thing that I'm looking for when I'm lending to a startup is capital and post transaction liquidity. So, you know, all too often we have projects where they come in and they say, I have, you know, you need, we need 10%. And they say, great, I have 10%. And you're like, well, yes, you need 10%, but there's other things like how are you going to pay, you know, rent and, and, and some of these kind of things. And what happens, you know, in, in, you know, I always tell people that COVID was never in anyone's business plan. Uh, and there were plenty of breweries that opened in January, February, and March of 2020. And so, had they had they not had some kind of working capital, mm-hmm. um, whether that was borrowed working capital or, or working capital that they had, um, it would have been you know it would have been catastrophic because they weren't able to establish. And so you know even more that what brings home the part uh, to me is you know that you should have um, you know not not have to put all your money into the transaction. You need some money left over. Yeah, yeah, I know it's <laughs> it's difficult to say you know you need money to borrow money, but at the same time, that's an argument for you know finding ways to to become revenue generating more quickly. And you know even if you're buying a turnkey facility that requires some renovations, both the you know like you said that what used to cost seven fifty now costs a house at a hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars, I should say. Uh, everybody who's been looking at real estate, you know, uh, private real estate, you know, their homes, that's that same story there. So, you know, if you, if you kind of factor in that, you know, what the actual dollar cost has grown, plus the, how quickly you get to revenue generating and that, you know, dealing with liquidity questions, you know, like what used to be a two-year timeline suddenly becomes, you know, it might be four months if you can get in and it's, you know, more or less turnkey. So that's not always a solution, but even if it's, there's a halfway step, there's lots of equipment on the secondary market rather than having to go to a fabricator and say, all right, start the clock. And you're, you know, that they they start the process of importing their stainless or whatever for tanks and like, okay, that's a very different thing than it's here. When can you get a truck? So, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I do think, you know, um, it hasn't, hit but if we do this again in a year the trend i'll probably tell you about is uh, i think use equipment i think that we're seeing we are starting to see that um you know really go up and so there is a lot more going on in the used market you you used to always hear people say oh i picked up this fermenter or i picked up this bride or i picked up whatever and we went over and took a truck and got it and but i think we're going to see a lot more systems because you know, for a while you'd, you'd have breweries that have you know a five barrel and a 20 barrel or a five mm-hmm. barrel and a 50 and so some are going to say okay let's figure you know out what we want to do and how do we want to handle that um, I, th- I think another trend that you know is probably important for startups to understand is um, 
where investors started having their head, right? And the way I think about this is part of the pandemic, you had investors that were very patient. They would say, hey, I'm thrilled to be drinking beer at the end of a bar. And it goes back to that same thing where they all thought that they were going to be the next InBev acquisition, right? Like, I don't really need you to pay me back because this, you know, my $5,000 I put into you is going to turn into a million when you get bought out. But I think, you know, the pandemic has, you know, put a little bit more insight in the fact that breweries or cideries or wineries or distilleries all have to act as an, a for-profit business, right? Because we, we let all of them kind of get away with going very long without having to make any money. And so mm-hmm. the investor has come back and said, I'll invest in your business, but I expect a return much quicker and they want that real return much quicker. And so, you know, you, you're going to, as, as a startup, you're going to have to start understanding what a realistic runaway is and you don't get four or five, six, seven, ten years before you make profit again, uh, they're gonna they're gonna want it pretty early and they're gonna want to understand quickly how they're gonna get the return investment back. Yeah, that's a really good point. I know um, you know, there's the there's sort of debt versus equity questions. And um so there's a whole separate webinar on that for sure to that's worth having. But um it's a it's a really good point when weighing options, just being aware of what the investment climate is. Um you know, it's we're nowhere near the you know VC space, which is probably a good thing. Where 10x in three years, right? That's not feasible in a manufacturing is linear. It's not right. That's how it goes. But it's no longer enough to just say, yeah, hey, we're chugging along. You know, investors are going to want to say, like, I I do want a return out of this, right? This is not um, just play money. You know, this is this is not just hey, I get I get to come in and drink beer for free or have you know come in and have my glass of wine and I get to show all my friends and. I get to take the tour of the vineyard and all that. It's there's going to be a little more um, whether it's not you know even if it's not involvement in the actual day to day operations, but still like hey, let's talk about when it is it realistic. When are we making money? Like what is what is that horizon? Because yeah, ten years is a long time. <laughs> ten years is a long yes. time in the industry in particular. So yeah, just uh, important to know you know when when you're trying to decide where, you know, which way to look. So, um, so on companies that are already stood up, you know, your existing companies that are looking for additional financing, whether to open that second facility or adding to their model, right. They say, Hey, I want to do the brand extension and set up the, you know, I'm a winery. I want to start doing distill. I want to start making grappa or let's say I'm a, you know, brewery. I want to make cider, whatever. Um, or I want to do the hub and spoke model, whatever the usage is for those types of people, even if it's just regular growth, what would you kind of suggest they consider when looking for additional financing? Yeah. So I think the first is understanding your model. Now we, you know, we just talked about investors and return on investment and, um, you know, we're, we're seeing, like, I, I had someone call me the other day and said, Hey, we're looking at the second location and they had lost substantial amounts of money in the prior three years. And, you know, we look at it and say, have you recovered from the pandemic? Have you recovered from things when you start to see a V model or you see something you've kind of seen a bottom and you've gone up? Unfortunately for this person, they hadn't seen the bottom yet because 2022 was a greater loss in 2021. And so, you know, kind of understanding, you know, yes, there's a want in saying, hey, look, we, we're we going to have opportunity costs if we miss this, right? Like there, there's a true cost to us missing this expansion, there's also a part to go, I mean, there, there are some that are recently in the news that have shut their doors, I mean, literally months after a new expansion, right? So they open a second location and then, you know, less than a quarter later, um, they are closing the doors on two locations. And so, you know, kind of understanding, making sure that you have enough runway. Um, you know, one of the questions I ask a lot, especially if you're running losses right now, I'm saying, great, how are you funding those losses? And if it's not this infinite amount of stream, you have to do one or two things. You either have to get rid of the losses or you have to continue to have the capital to weather those losses. And, and that's where sometimes you're seeing these mergers or these sales or you're um, seeing, seeing different things happen, right? Someone, you know, selling capacity, you know, that, that's one thing that is kind of a trend right now. I don't think, I don't think we're going to talk about that, but, you know, the contract brewing trend mm-hmm. where people are saying, 
you know, we are up only our, our brand is only taking up 50% of our capacity, but we need more money. Let's go, you know, sell that capacity to someone else and we'll brew their brands for them. Um, you know, that, that is becoming a, a pretty big trend. So I, I would say that, you know, if you're existing, make sure that your current operations are solid, that you have a plan. I mean, the biggest thing for me is if someone asks for money, I want to, you know, I want them to have thought of the questions I'm probably going to ask them. So when I ask them something, they don't say, hmm, that's a good question. We had thought about that. Uh, we'll get back to you, right? Especially because what I'm asking about usually is not, shouldn't be that hard. It should be about, you know, your current operations. It should be about, all right, how are you planning to put these things together? So just kind of understanding, you know, where where have you been and where are you going? And, you know, what uh, is the purpose of this? So again, you know, if you, you talk about the hub and smoke, spoke, making sure that you get the spot right and saying, you know, like we're, we're talking to someone and they're, and they're saying, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna open up that second location in our number two location. So we went and looked and said, where do we sell the most amount of ears? And number one is where our existing pr production is. We're gonna go put a tap room in number two. That's pretty logical, but not everyone does that. A lot of people say, well, we found this really cool spot. We actually don't sell any beer over here yet. But, you know, if we build it, they'll come. It's a lot more of that strategic business to say, hey, look, we already know people love our beer in this market. Now let's go have them have a place to drink our beer, sell our beer at a higher margin and, and, and be more strategic about it. So that that's the type of things that I would want existing um, owners to understand. And especially if they look, you know, you talk about, you know, creating these beverage brands to look and say, what what are the things that we're missing out on? So if, you know, you've got a bunch of wine drinkers, uh, but you only sell, you know, bourbon and gin, you know, how do you, how do you integrate that into your portfolio at the most economical way? And sometimes that may be having somebody contract a house frame for you or do something, you know, where you don't have to go out and uh, reinvent the wheel. So I think, you know, again, kind of, kind of goes back to the fact that money is not expensive, but it's not free. And so kind of understanding how do you strategically return? My, my number one thing and the, the reason I got into this was to help return money to the bottom line of the companies, right? And so I wanna make sure that we've got a strategic way for what starts at the top to make its way down to the bottom um, where it's paying you know, owners and investors and employees mm -hmm. uh, and giving a great product to the consumer. And so you know, sometimes it's not, the, the answer is not always go spend a bunch of money. It's how do we do something more strategically what we have? Yeah, yeah, especially it's, buying your way out of a problem, right? It's uh, it's not easy, especially when you're borrowing that money. You know, th there's throwing money at a problem. Yeah, you might see the sales increase, but is it enough to justify the expense of, of getting that money in? I mean, like there's, there's costs associated with however you're bringing money in and whether you're giving up equity or if you're financing a big expansion, whatever the case may be, it's, you know, you it's it should be moving the needle, not just on, revenue, right? Revenue is only part of the equation. And sometimes people say like, oh, well, we doubled sales. Well, you tripled your liabilities. <laughs> like, what? Yeah. <laughs> so we're not getting any ground here. Yeah. Um, we, we see that pretty frequently where someone says, well, we went from here to here on this year, but then, you know, they're still running at a negative, even a margin. And you're like, yeah, but that just means you lost more money because you yeah. know, it costs more. And, and, and so this actually, you lost more like, yes, but over time, and that's the problem is it's not always an infinite runway that says, you know, yes, if we keep building sales of this trajectory and, you know, X number of years, we're going to be in a good position. But what if you don't have that X number of years? That's the, the issue you run into. And this is, again, another another discussion entirely. But thinking about companies need to think about their kind of event horizons for a lot of these things of part of the reason you're seeing some closures around is um, a lot of people are hitting your ten, their 10 year lease renewal. Um, and if their terms are getting renegotiated or if they have to decide if they're going to kind of invest another 10 years into their business. Okay. Like there, that's a, that's a big decision. 10 years is a yep. long time in a person's life, certainly within this industry. Um, or, you know, um, okay, well, what's, what's the kind of timeline for the repayment of your of your existing loan? Are there other kinds of parts of your business that you finance? What's the succession plan, right? That's, we're starting to get to that phase in this industry. And it's, you know, I'm sure that there are, you know, a handful of older brands that have been around that have changed, you know, hands a couple of times. But in general, the industry is certainly in Virginia, there's not 
a huge, you know, this, this large number of examples of, well, what do we do when somebody's looking to for the next thing, or, Hey, I've, I've put in my time. What's next, you know, for, for the future of the, the company being mindful about when to borrow and for what purpose, um, is it just to sort of goose evaluation or is it actually contributing to the, um, you know, the actual, the, the financial health of the company? Um, you know, lots of people say, oh, well, we tripled sales this year. It's like, well, yeah, but you, but you just borrowed a ton of money and you entered 20 markets and you're suddenly employing tons of people. And, you know, it's, um, the, the sort of long-term health is, uh, hard to see, you know, it's hard to see the forest for the trees sometimes. So I don't mean to be doom and gloom or anything like that. I just want yes. to be, I want people, you know, I want companies to come out, you know, healthy on these things. It's, you know, it's, um, you know, not, most people who enter this industry are not going to be finance professionals themselves, although some certainly, you know, reformed finance people themselves. Uh, but, uh, you know, relying on, you know, experts to help them understand like the value of, of different money. So, um, so with all that said, from your perspective as, you know, an, uh, an SBA lender, um, are there any changes either since we last spoke or since you first got started in how you approach or evaluate deals that you, that company should be aware of, are there, you know, your perspective when you're approaching a table, have you had kind of changed how you've thought about it? Yeah. So I think we talked a little about the fact that, you know, to mainly for our borrower sanity, you know, we're getting a lot more of the cost up front. So getting hard levels of the cost up front. So understand the construction, you know, the, the equipment quotes are pretty easy, you know, trying to understand the soft cost, being able to put those up front. So, you know, looking at, because there, there are projects that we worked on, you know, at, and I'll, I'll use one example. There, there's a project that we worked on for 14 months, kind of sorting through a bunch of things. Not all of them were construction later, but we got to the end and the GC gave them a quote and they said, all right, this looks good. And they said, all right, good. Well, we need a plan for the six months you're going to close your brewery. And the customer said, what? We're not closing our brewery for six months. If we close our brewery for six months, we'll come back and there won't be any clients. And so they went back and said, well, now we're not going to do that project anymore. And so they laid out architecture costs. They laid out a bunch of expenses, um, you know, and they're, they're just sunk costs because of the fact that the project had changed so substantially from where they were. So, you know, it, it, it's having those conversations up front. It's, you know, very on the very early. And I, I'm now telling people like, have you talked to a GC? Yeah. And more than just a GC walk through our spot and kind of point over there and point over there, you know, like having some more in-depth discussions where you're doing a little legwork to say, okay, does this actually, can we actually make this work? So that that's one that we're doing. Um, I think we're continuing to look at, you know, the, you know, the resumes of who is operating the brewery and what value they add. Um, you know, I think there was a little bit of a window of time that said, hey, I'm a home brewer, give me some money, right? And that has, uh, I think that time COVID has kind of brought that to an end. I mean, there are still gonna be plenty of home brewers that are gonna open, but they're also going and getting a, they may not be the head brewer. They may not, you know, be that. So they're, so they're you know, maybe they're operating it, but they are bringing on someone who has professional commercial experience. And so kind of understanding you know, what, what are the strengths and weaknesses that everyone brings to it, but also just making sure that people understand, Hey, look, let, like we are really, really like drilling down into the um, projections, you know, whether that's an expansion or new and saying, you know, are these realistic, you know, cause you'll get something, you know, this was a franchise. This was not a brewery, but it was a, um, a, I'll call it a brew pub for lack of better words. It's not mm -hmm. exactly what it was. But, you know, the person came to us and said, hey, look, I expect in this area, we're going to do about $2 million. And we went to the franchise or of this concept and they said, well, in 2022, the average was 1.3 million. And so going and looking and saying, okay, you know, you think you're going to make 2 million in sales. And the historic of this franchise has been you know, the highest ever. It was a, it's an emerging franchise, but the highest ever, like one store had $2 million. And so look at it and say, does, does that really make sense? So I think, you know, just doing a lot more due diligence and making sure that the money, you know, because there's nothing worse than you think you're going to do 2 million and you do 1.3 because then you've got, 
you know, seven hundred thousand dollars of revenue that that you can't account for. So those are the kind of things that I think we're just doing a little bit more of. It's just taking our time, making sure that we are you know, getting the numbers right, getting the expenses right, and making sure that the customer understands what we're getting into. Because I think you know, people were just going, oh, I'm going to make a ton of money. This is going to be easy. We'll, we'll just go through this. But I think we're seeing more projects with large change orders and with the not. And so just making sure that, you know, everything, everything is, uh, you know, is, is done in an appropriate way to make sure that um, there's no surprises. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the only guarantee with pro forma financials projections is that they're not going to be spot on, right? Like <laughs> the world is a, is a messy place, but um, getting as close as you can, right? And that's, you know, you could put any numbers down on paper, being able to justify those numbers to yourself and to lenders or investors or whoever, you know, you need that needs to see those numbers. Um, I know it's a, it's a very difficult industry to benchmark because it does change so quickly. Um, so it's not, it's not like a, there's a, Oh, I'm a. This is the location that I'm in. This is the product category I'm in. Here is how much I should be expecting. Right? You know, there's all kinds of context to apply, but as much as possible, going out there doing that homework before you go speak to a banker, because I I can tell you, Jason's got plenty on his plate, and um, there's not you know an infinite amount of time to be able to go uh, and and work through these things, and that's part of what, you know, the CBA program is here for is to, um, you know, potentially kick the tires on some of these things. And if you can explain it to me, um, or, or, you know, one of the, my SBDC colleagues, um, that's good. And then you can go and speak to a banker, you know, that's just, just being able getting it out of your head onto paper, having those numbers come from a real place, you know, not only will it help on the finance side, but it also hopefully, you know, help you sleep a little better at night. Um, you know, knowing that it all comes from somewhere. So, um, we had one question come in that I wanted to, to uh, ask you here. So uh, George says, many prospective brewery owners that I've spoken to uh, plan to purchase brewing equipment size for full sales, sales two to four years, Oops. and um, and do half brew days or one to two brew days per week, uh, whereas they could purchase a small system and do double brew days or brew more often and save on capital and perhaps larger equipment uh, and purchase larger equipment if needed later. So the sort of buying the system to grow into, um, kind of having the, you know, have finance that on the front and not really using it very often versus, you know, buy a system that gets you a couple of years, you know, you churn on it and, you know, you kind of increase your labor costs. Uh, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah. So I, I see this come, I don't know if there's a one size fit all on this because I see a lot of people who um, choose both routes. So you'll see a lot of people um, that'll do, um, you know, we, we, I have seen people who say, we're going to do a one barrel system and you are, you are hammering it, right? Because that means that, you know, you have to brew a ton to keep a variety of beer on yours. Uh, but the other issue is, you know, if you do one that's much larger and you're brewing a batch um, and you're like, all right, we're going to brew this and this is our IPA for the month or you know, quarter, right? I, I don't know how long it'll last them. You know, you could run into some, uh, you could run into some quality issues, right? So it's not mm -hmm. as going to be as fresh. I, I would tell you that, you know, the biggest, one of the biggest challenges that we are running into right now for people is not necessarily the difference, you know, the difference between a one, a five, a seven, a 10 barrel. Um, th there's not, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, 20 to 30 to 50 to thousand dollars kind of in there right so it's not it's not a huge amount of equipment cost um, but the staffing the staffing is becoming an issue right and you know if you can't find the right people um, and, and and there's so much in the industry right now about you know work-life balance and, and asking someone to show up and you know turn three one barrel batches in a day or something like that versus saying hey look we brew on Monday Wednesday Friday or we brew Tuesday Thursday or we do whatever you know, and the, other than that, it's cellaring and, you know, you know, doing those kind of things, um, you know, it's important. So, I, so I, I would tell you that I don't know that there's a one size fits all on it. I think part of it is how big do you want to do? What, what's your dream? I would tell you that, you know, getting something probably in a two, if you're trying to make money, getting something smaller than a two barrel, um, you know, is very hard to do. Uh, it's very hard to make those numbers work on, you know, a one barrel system. 
Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But I but I think what we're seeing most of the time is people brewing on like a five or a seven barrel, um, and and saying, hey, look, we're gonna we'll, we'll figure it out. And you know, one of the other secrets is okay, maybe you brew a five barrel stout, but you treat you know three barrels of one of one one way and two barrels uh, another, and now you've got two different beers that came out of the same batch. So just trying to figure figure those aspects of it. So I think a lot of it just has to do with the business planning and what makes sense for you is if cheap labor, which I don't know there's such thing anymore, is easily available, then yeah, you can, you know, use the labor the labor. But I think for the most part it's being strategic and trying to figure it out, you know, how to you make the equipment make life easier for the people working. Yeah, that's and so much it's not a very satisfying answer to say it depends, but it does depend on where you're at. What does your market look like? What is your model? Try, you know, trying what are you trying to accomplish here? You know, there's the if you're in-house and you need to fill a dozen draft lines, you're going to have a different solution than if you're saying, hey, I want to enter distribution. I'm going to be riding my flagships. Um, this is in the sort of uh, kind of beer and spirits sense where you're constantly churning, producing your round. Um, that's just, you know, that's, do you have good labor availability in your market or are you uh, going to be struggling? If you're going to be doing it yourself, I'd say, um, you know, if you're an owner operator on the production side, please, please, please factor in your time. Um, you know, even if you're not paying yourself in the beginning, um, there may come a day where you need to pay somebody. And all of a sudden, if that gets added to your, you know, your cash flow every month of, oh, all of a sudden I'm paying somebody who's not me, um, that can be really difficult. So um, being creative with that, trying to find that, you know, what's going to help you accomplish your goals, being aware that the secondary market for systems may be picking up. So you might be able to re- retool a little bit cheaper, um, but at the same time, you need to be able to, there's like, there's a cost to resizing your system. So, um, I've worked with plenty of companies that, Hey, maybe they can ride their, uh, brew house for a good amount of time. Say, Hey, I was, I was able to churn, really push my 15 barrel before I changed to a 30, but I undersized on some other things, not realizing how many fermenters to put in. So I didn't put enough glycol. I didn't put in uh, a big enough walk-in. So even it's the, the less exciting side of, oh, my, my brew house, my production side, whatever. But it's like, do you have enough storage? It's, it can be that too, where you get caught. Uh, we have a couple more questions, which is great. Um, let's start with Sheridan. Um, thoughts on rising input costs and passing those on to higher product costs um, at this point. So we, we are starting to see a lot. Uh, the market, I think, has accepted... You know that people have gone from four and five dollar craft beers to six and seven and eight dollar, and um, you know one of the things that I I hear a lot, um, you know, and I'm in a couple of different uh, groups that just kind of the passive observer, but you hear people saying, you know, maybe you if you are being conscious of your price point, then instead of pour, you know, if it's a if you want to stay at a five dollar pour, go from a sixteen ounce to a twelve ounce pour or you know, figure out how to change the deliverable quantities in some point in time. So, um, I, you know, I know this is not the, the platform for this, but there are, um, you know, plenty of people out there that that's what they help breweries do is go and look mm-hmm. and say, okay, great. You want to make X number of margin on this beer. Here's how you deliver it. You either sell it at this price point, it can't go into distribution, you know, right. or you deliver it at this. And, and I was at a, uh, so I have partnered up uh, uh, a couple of times uh, doing some of these uh, local conferences. And one of the suggestions was if you've got a real premium one, uh, put in a flight. So you can say, hey, look, you can only buy this beer in this flight at this type of margin. So being able to kind of understand those pieces. Mm-hmm. So so there, there are certain ways to either increasing the price or being smart about the fact that, hey, look, we left the price the same, but you get four less ounces. This one doesn't come into the pint. It comes a 12 ounce or a 10 ounce or half pours or however it comes um, to make, you gotta, you gotta protect the brewery's margin at that point. Yeah, absolutely. There's all kinds of ways that, you know, there's a certain point where you have to pass it on. And especially if you're in distribution, being methodical about that, when's the time where you're going to, you know, get up and above that and you can negotiate with your distributor to say, you know, if you're, if you have a distributor and you're out in the, the marketplace, okay, I'm going to, you need to eat a little bit of this. And then the next time it's up to me or it needs to go out, uh, hit the shelf a little bit higher. But of course, being aware of the impact where you stand relative to others, it's a very different thing to be 
you know, if you're a wine, a $15 bottle versus a $20 bottle or, you know, 20 to 30 or beer, if you're $11.99, a six pack versus $12.49, like that, that can make a major impact on sales. So it might be worth eating the cost up to a point. Um, In-house, you have more control, which is great, you know, um, doing everything you can look at uh, recipe reformulations, looking at all of your production processes to decrease loss so that you're not, you know, if you have 80% yield, if you get a couple points on that, you can stretch things a little further, um, working with your staff to make sure they're not giving away free product because, you know, if you can get one or two more glasses, um, you know, if you're pouring wine, how many, you know, are, they, are, are people really pouring a five or six ounce pour? What does that look like? So all kinds of way to button that up. We, we could, uh, you know, talk about that, but, uh, certainly there comes a point where it comes to passing it on. And I think a lot of it comes down to what did it do for your market standing? Like, where do you stand up uh, relative to other folks? Um, there was a question that came in from Parag, and I think that this one's going to be uh, very much the, it depends, but what's a good size, uh, like production? Uh, I think this is for beer, so barrel size um, for break even for experience. So I think, you know, what you said which is my experience too two barrels and below is really hard unless you are have almost no overhead and you own the facility already and you own you have connection to that and you have no employees um I, like i'd say you know I, and again you know it's going to depend on what city it is and how you got into the building and all that kind of stuff but i, I would say that generally i think you need to be at probably about a five barrel system or bigger yeah that's that's been my experience and i think it used to be, you know, of, of course, like the, the model of taproom only breweries um, wasn't something you really saw much of. It's certainly in Virginia, um, not something that was uh, all that prevalent, but you're starting to see more and more people say, hey, I'm not in distribution, but I'm also not a brew pub, right? You come to me, I, pa I have packaged product. Maybe I bring in a mobile canner and you can buy my beer to go more easily, um, but I'm not really worrying about that. Or if I have a distribution partner, it's a smaller shop and they're just doing targeted drops to places that can, uh, they're going to hand sell my products for me. I don't have to deal with chains and they're only going to focus on, um, you know, the, the accounts that can justify my price point or I'll do some home delivery. So um, this goes to question, another question from George about which type breweries in particular, uh, you know, have we found to be the most profitable? And like, to my experience, Recently, the people that have fared well, and some of it is just dumb luck, has been the folks who have had more control over their process. So that's the tap room, not having to deal with the overhead of a restaurant, or if they do have a, a food option that has, you know, pizza, you have a, a hood, you have a prep station, you don't have, you know, a, a six person staff every night, um, and lots of food waste kind of thing. Um Jason, you have a, a bigger sense of the world when it comes to this. Any, any thoughts yeah. on models? I think the tapper model works very well, uh, especially now uh, because you can put those in a relatively small footprint in very high density area. So you can put a a brewery only tap room on Main Street on the first floor, and those do very very well. But if you've got a large production, you got something like that, it may may different. Um, the brew pub model, I still like the brew pub model. Uh, part of the reason I like the brew pub model is because in most states you can serve your beer, you can serve other people's beers. You can serve wine, cider, and spirits that you didn't produce. Um, and so it allows you to collect, collect a lot of revenue across, you know, a lot of people. And one of the things that, you know, a lot of breweries uh, and cideries and wineries all fight with is on Saturday at about, from about three to about eight, 30 or nine, they have a big gap. And so if you've got a good food element there, it keeps people on site drinking your product. So um, if you're going to do a food, you know, it doesn't have to be elaborate. There are a lot of amazing brew pubs where the food is just as good as the, the beer. There's other places where they're kicking out some sandwiches or they're kicking mm -hmm. out, you know, pizza or they're kicking out, you know, pretzel tops or whatever they're doing um, just to, you know, make, to keep people there. Yeah, absolutely. And again, thinking about those innovative models where, if it's the hub and spoke model or, um, you know, having multiple product categories, uh, I'll say I'm starting to see a lot more partnerships um, of production. Like, hey, I am an expert in my product, whether that's wine or beer, to a lesser extent spirits, but for cider, I know a restaurant that has been 
really great partner. Maybe we find a way to do this and we each specialize in what we do best. Um, and then you can both, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of virtuous cycle, the relationship between food and drink. So there are, there are lots of ways, but I think, um, yeah, right now I would say in general being large scale, looking for massive distribution, unless you're doing something, uh, really unique. Um, and you, it makes sense to go, uh, broad rather than deep. Um, just having more control over the process, finding a way to be profitable at a scale where you can put your arms around it and not expecting to take over the world again, unless you're doing something that's a brand new category. You know, we all thought you know, there was a while salt sort of looked like that, but there's lots of entrance now. So yeah. Um, and then uh, I guess I'll ask you the last question that I have since we uh, we are running out of time here. Um, what would you tell a small producer weighing, you know, if they had basically one kind of an elevator pitch or somebody said, all right, like, oh, they, they grab you at the end of your talk and they say, okay, so what's the one thing I need to know? I'm looking, I'm trying to really trying to weigh my capital options. The one thing that I think everyone would need to know is that it's okay not to be huge right away. Uh, that it's a lot easier to stay small keep the investors and the people that surrounded you in kind of a small area and be strategic about the financing you have. So don't get over leveraged and take your time because it'd be, it's better to slowly scale yourself without putting yourself too much at risk um, than it is trying to go super high level and having a lot of risk in the early goings. It's a, uh, it's great. It's, it's hard to be patient, you know, uh, but especially these days, you know, being, being very careful. It's a, it's a good, it's a good lesson. Well, uh, with that, I think we'll wrap up Jason. Thank you so much for lending your expertise again. I feel like, you know, we could be picking your brain all day long, but I know you've got lots of, lots of places to go. So thank you so much for your time and thank you all for tuning into this, uh, this month's webinar. Thanks. Yes. I'd like to thank you all too. And I would like to thank everyone for attending today's session. You will receive an email with a link to the recording um, that you've just seen today. Um, if you would like to sign up for upcoming web webinars or access recorded webinars, please visit virginiasbdc.org forward slash training. These resources are designed to be used in collaboration with your local SBDC advisors. You can sign up for a free and confidential session by emailing help at virginiasbdc.org or via our website. We hope to see you at our next session. Take care. Thanks, everybody.